On Mother's Day this year, my husband Bart and I went out for a drive. We covered 85 miles within the town of Wethersfield. This is a really small town, but you can cover 85 miles of roads just by going on every dirt road you can find. We were looking for old barns and we found a bunch of them. We found 55 of what I call old barns. Now some of these might not be as old as they look. Some just have fallen on hard times. Um, but most of them were pretty darn old. <laughs> so we just drove around and we'd stop in front of one of these barns and I'd get out and I'd take a bunch of pictures. It was May, so the leaves weren't on the trees yet. They were just budding out, so it was perfect because I could still see the barns and I could see their structure and I could see the stuff that was around them telling me some of their history. Um, so I would go back in the car and I'd make notes about where this was and little notes about whose house it was. Um, I recorded on a map where, where each barn was and we'd carry on to the next one. It took us all day and actually we went back again a couple weeks later and got a few more of them to make up the 55 that I had. So then I got home and I started doing the research. I wanted to know which ones of these barns were old, which ones had really interesting stories, and um, then trying to tie the story of these barns into why they look the way they look now. Or, you know, I, I felt like these old barns, they're sort of starting to crumble into the ground and they just want to be recognized. They want to be known for, for what they were at one time and they were a huge part of this town. So I pulled out the history books. Um, I went to the Historical Society and got some help there. Um, the two books that I found were the most helpful to me were Historic Sites and Structures of Wethersfield, which is a uh, Wethersfield Historical Society publication uh, printed in 1993 and uh, Weathersfield Century 1 by John E. Hurd. There's also Weathersfield Century 2, and I used that a little bit, but most of these barns were from the 19th century, being the first century. Um, Weathersfield was founded in 1761, but there weren't a whole lot of farms set up and running um, until the end of the 18th century. So I had a bunch of history. I narrowed it down to 15 barns that particularly interested me, both in um, the, the way they're looking today and the history that they have that I was able to find and some of the photographs that I got, some were better than others. So I narrowed it down to those 15 and I went to work one by one. I pieced the history of these barns together in a painting. So I started by um, doing the research on, I take a, one of the barn, a photograph of one of the barns and do the research on that barn. I went online and searched through old newspapers and found some wonderful articles and advertisements and um, the, the advertisements are great because there's line art and things in those. These are newspapers that go back to 1800. Um, so just fascinating and really gave me a sense of what, what it was like here in Wethersfield at that time. Um, so I used, in each of these paintings, I used pieces of newspaper in the, in the sky in the background. I would gather that information online, print out the newspaper, and then I printed it on newsprint so that it looked like a newspaper and it, it wears like a newspaper. When I get it wet, it acts like newspaper would act. So it's very close to as if I had the actual newspaper from 1805. Um, so I tore up those newspapers and I pasted them down on the canvas um, to create my background. So you can see the text uh, and parts of it I left so that you can read the text if I felt that it was really important. 
but in most cases it's it's kind of hard to read it um, you can tell that there's something going on there to do with that barn um, and that's in the sky so I paste it it dries and then I paint over it doing washes for the clouds and some light and some color um, and then I start building building it up into the foreground I paint the background mountains uh, Mount Scutney is in almost every single one of these um, I found that the the coolest way to do the mountain was to just paint sheets of paper in the color the colors and the textures that I see on the mountain on a day-to-day -day basis let it dry tear it up and glue those pieces down it seems like a very weird way to do things, but it's just fascinating and I get to play with it and you, uh, you can move the paper around until it looks right and then you glue it down. Uh, so I get the background all done and then I, I put the barn down. So I painted the barn on paper. I cut it out with an X-Acto knife. Quite often I have to cut the different sections of the barn out. So it's like putting a jigsaw puzzle together on, on the painting. Then I start working towards the foreground. And for most of these, there's only a couple that I didn't do this, I tried to put something in the foreground that would put the barn back in its time. So um, there are stagecoaches, there are farm wagons, there's a wheelbarrow in one. Those were all things that I found and redrew on paper and then painted on paper and then cut them out with the X-Acto knife or tore them out. Sometimes tearing it gives a better edge so it's rougher. Um, and then I glue it down. And so now I've built towards the foreground even more. Then I go back in when it's all dry. I go back in and paint trees and paint foreground. Um, and it's just, it's just fun. It's just playing, playing with cut paper and playing with paint and combining um, collage with painting. I'm just having a great time. So you will see on these next, I have 11 paintings I'm going to show you. One, one is not a collage. It's from 27 years ago when I first moved here, but it's an old barn. So I put it in there to show you the progression of my work. Um, I hope to do many more of these. I feel like Weathersfield is the tip of the iceberg. I could go all over Vermont or maybe to other states and um, research these fascinating old barns and, and the, the way people lived in those times. So I hope you enjoy it. Um, sorry that we can't all be together, but we can do it this way. So thanks for watching. My love affair with Vermont Barnes began when we moved to Weathersfield in 1994. Henry Gould's enormous barn needed our help. The north and south wings of the dairy barn were pulling the back wall of the original main barn down. They needed to go. It tore at my heart to mess with this wonderful piece of history, but the integrity of the old main barn was at stake. A board from the south wing became my canvas complete with a knot hole above the stone foundation and a very rough and cracked surface. I wanted Henry's big old dairy barn to be remembered, so I painted it just as it was before the wings came down. Little did I know this would become a theme for my work 27 years later. This is the first piece of this series that I made with the intent of creating a whole group of these Ode to Old Barns paintings. This is our barn, or I should say Henry Gould's barn, or Mr. Stroh's barn, or maybe Chauncey Kimball's. The history is a little murky, but this barn goes way back. It looks like it may have been moved here at some time, or maybe it was moved and turned and built into the hill to become a bank barn. I have stood inside it hundreds of times, gazing up at its bones, the beams and posts and the mismatched pieces of the underside of the roof, and asked it to tell me its story. It tells me to be patient and just take in its beauty. So I sit in the dusty hay and dream about the times gone by and this barn's place in it 
and the animals that brought it to life. In the background sky, you see ghostly images of cows and sheep. I sketched these out, then pasted them over the text about Vermont and its farms. The stone wall zigs and zags with a sloppy arrangement of its past. I'm sure every farmer who has tended this barn and the animals within it has rearranged some of those stones, leaving his or her mark on this piece of Vermont history. I found this barn hiding behind a lot of trees and shrubs on a back road I very rarely travel. Painted over the boarded up door are blue letters spelling out two bold words, barn unsafe. That made me sad. The barn posed for me as I took its picture. In doing some research, I found that this barn was probably from the early 19th century and that there was a second barn near it. It turns out that the second barn was moved the year before I moved to Wethersfield to become a part of the Dan Foster House Museum, home of the Wethersfield Historical Society. But this barn was left behind. It probably was primarily used for hay storage. So I chose to show these men pitching a load of hay, one forkful at a time, while the horse who brought the wagon there waits patiently. The background sky is made up of a handwritten farm ledger from the early 1800s, torn into pieces and glued randomly. The little photo in the upper left shows the beginning of the painting. I enlarged the photo to fit the barn on the canvas, then painted behind, around, and over it to put it back in its century. The two trunks sticking up behind it were in the original photo. I removed them and painted a few trees in the foreground instead. There's some time travel going on here. The barn is as it stands today, while the landscape and activities suggest a moment maybe 200 years ago. This barn stands very close to the edge of a now dead end gravel street called Grout Road. I hadn't ever noticed it until we started looking for old roads that might be hiding some old barns. This one was once on the coach road that went through to Tarbell Hill in Cavendish. That got me looking for information about stagecoaches in the mid-1800s. First, I found an image of a ticket for a ride from Brattleboro to Montpelier on September 8, 1848. That's 173 years ago, almost to the day. While the rider with this ticket probably traveled closer to the river than where this barn is, it's not that far away. So I put the ticket in the sky behind the tree to the left of the barn. Then I found an advertisement from a newspaper dated July 13, 1850, describing a stage which would travel from Proctorsville through Duttonville, Upper Falls, Greenbush, Felchville, and Brownsville on its way to Windsor. How they got from Upper Falls to Greenbush, I don't know for certain, but perhaps it was up through Grout Road to Tarbell Hill Road, maybe? So that ad is in the upper right background. Then I went looking for a Vermont stagecoach with people. I found a fantastic photo of a stagecoach overflowing with people in Granville, Vermont from the mid to late 1800s. What a treat. I printed it out to the size I needed for my painting and went to work bringing the horses and people to life. After the paint had dried, I cut it out and glued it on my painting, giving the travelers a little time in Wethersfield. I hope they enjoyed the trip. This charming old barn is at the end of John Jensen Road in the southwestern corner of the town. The original house was built in 1799 for Silas Bigelow and his wife Elizabeth. They must have had some kind of barn for the animals. Whether any of this barn as it stands today was a part of that or not, I don't know. Silas Bigelow was a founding member of the North Springfield Baptist Church and he was a deacon there from 1807 until his death in 1833. I used old folk art paintings to dream up an image of Deacon Bigelow and his wife in their Sunday best, ready to head off to the church. The paper in the sky is the page from the Vermont Telegraph with Silas's obituary on the right-hand side. The road is created using some torn copies of handwritten sermons from the time. The variety of textures from the stones in the wall to the boards on the barn and all the torn papers creates a roughness which sends us back in time to a quieter place. 
This was originally the farm of Alan Murray. The house was originally built around 1800, so some part of the barn probably was built then as well. Mount Escutney rises up behind, sheltering the farm from the cold north winds. This has been a working dairy barn continuously until very recently. I chose to show it as it might have looked later in the 19th century. The man driving the wagon is probably taking milk, cream, or butter to be sold and delivered to urban areas like Boston or New York. I used old photographs for inspiration to create the horse, wagon, and wheelbarrow. I painted these on paper, and after they were dry, carefully cut out the horse, wagon, and all those spokes in the wheels, and glued them onto the painting. This gives a three-dimensional feeling, which I really love in these pieces. Some of these collages are made up of dozens of layers of paper. The photo in the bottom right is the one I used for my main source of reference. It's a wonderful barn used mostly for storage now. Greenbush is a part of Weathersfield that was settled back in the late 1700s. The house across the street from this large barn was originally owned by a guy named Newbury Eddy. His son, Isaac, was an inventor and printmaker, and Isaac's son, Oliver Tarbell Eddy, was quite a famous painter. I was hoping to tie all of that art and craft into this impressive barn, but it turns out that this barn was built later in the 19th century, after the Eddies had moved to Troy, New York. The barn is made up of multiple levels, and there are ways to get cows into most of them. There's even an interior silo. This must have been a very active dairy barn for quite some time. The flat fields across the road are beautiful and lush. Any cow must have been thrilled to live there. The paper in the background was taken from a newspaper for farmers. The text describes the newest methods for refrigeration. This was huge for the dairy industry, as up to that time, cream was made into butter, which would last longer than unrefrigerated milk. In this painting, the horse is pulling a wagon with a load of full milk cans off to market. The barn stands empty today, close to the edge of Route 106. The things I dug up on this barn are fascinating. It's not far from the previous Greenbush barn, sitting at the corner of Route 106 and Tarbell Hill Road. The house, which still stands, dates back to 1787. It was an inn run by Thomas Stoughton, and in 1804, he helped incorporate the Weathersfield Turnpike Company. Stagecoaches would travel past his inn, and a toll was paid. Meals would be had at the inn, and horses were rested or changed out. The barn at the inn provided housing for these horses. The text here says, the proprietor will perform this route himself and is determined that no exertion shall be wanting to render the passage easy and commodious. Hmm, what a bumpy, rough ride that must have been in all kinds of weather with drivers determined to get their passengers to the next stage on time to connect. The darker area on the barn indicates where another barn was once attached. How many horses rested here over the years? The road in the foreground is a map of the state showing the network of Vermont roadways in 1800, so hard to even imagine. In 1811, William Jarvis bought 2,000 acres of land in what's called Weathersfield Bow. The land sits on the banks of the Connecticut River and was a perfect place for raising sheep. Jarvis was Thomas Jefferson's consul to Portugal from 1802 to 1811. When Napoleon caused chaos in Spain, Jarvis found a way to export the country's merino sheep. They were known for their soft, water-resistant, and long-fibered wool, so they became enormously popular. Consul Jarvis's farm encompassed a large part of the bow. He was known to have raised fine riding horses, pigs, and cows, as well as dogs to tend his fancy sheep. There was a ferry that crossed the river from his land to the Claremont side, and he would often ride his horse down to the ferry to cross over and visit his relatives. This barn sits close to the ferry road. Most of it would have been built after Jarvis's death in 1859, but apparently some posts and beams in this barn may have come from one of Jarvis's early barns. It has been added onto over the years, probably housing cows and horses as well as sheep. 
Jarvis was largely responsible for the sheep craze called Merino mania in the mid 1800s in Vermont. At one time, a Merino ram sold for $1,500. There were nearly four million sheep in New England by 1840. In the background, there are several references to Merino sheep. The bill of lading is from William Jarvis to President James Madison, dated August 28, 1810 describing two Spanish ewes coming to the United States on a ship called the Citizen. I go by this barn when I take the dirt road shortcut to Windsor. Of course, I always lose time because I have to stop and admire that cupola. There is a lot of overgrowth now, but it's clear that it was once a very stately farm. The interstate rumbles by just a few hundred yards away now, it's hard to imagine what these farmers were forced to give up when the highway was built in the 1960s. I chose pages from the Vermont Farmer newspaper from August 12, 1881. This farm would have been very active then, and maybe they had a chance to read this paper from time to time. It has wonderful little bits of farming advice, like this one. Pigs are the best stock to have access to the orchard. They will do the most good and least harm. They will harvest the artichokes and give the land a pretty thorough fall plowing. They will also spread much valuable manure and destroy millions of hurtful vermin in the larval state. To the right is a little pencil sketch of how I plan to lay out this painting. The horses and pigs came later when I learned about how all these animals helped to promote a healthier farm. This little barn sits at the northeast end of Henry Gould Road. It sits next to the Cape Cod style house, which was built around 1790. With the number of stone walls scattered throughout the woods here, we can be pretty sure this area was covered with sheep during the Merino craze. Most of Escutney Mountain was cleared of trees and sheep were almost as bountiful as the stones that made up the walls. Now it is thickly forested but the walls wind their ways through the tall trees, giving evidence of the sheep pastures that were once there. As in so many of these paintings of Barnes and Wethersfield, the mountain rests behind. You can't go very far within Wethersfield town lines and not have a view of the mountain. And when you're approaching from some distance away, its monadnock shape makes it easily and identifiable. It's like a beacon when you're coming home and every day it looks just a little bit different. The handwriting in the background is from a journal of a Vermont farmer in 1834. He writes about shingling the milk house until a thunderstorm came through. I painted the old apple tree in the foreground because the apple trees in my yard are dropping fruit like crazy right now, and it just seemed fitting. Thank you for watching my presentation. If you'd like to get in touch with me, if you have questions, comments, or even want to suggest some old barns that might like to be painted, please feel free to give me a call or send me an email at lisa at canvasworksdesigns.com. Thank you.